Hello, I'm Murray Hitzman, Director of the Irish Center of Research in Applied Geosciences at University College Dublin. And myself and Hallelujah Nanatu Ekanjo, who is a PhD candidate here, will be talking today about Earth materials and a sustainable future. I'd like to start off by acknowledging that yesterday was a very important day, the International Women's Day, and it's critical that we actually eliminate barriers for both gender and minor and diversity throughout industry and society if we're going to attain the sustainable future we all are looking for. So the talk today is going to talk about looking for a reliable, affordable, and just supply of earth materials that can provide the foundation for a sustainable future. And diverse young people will be the key to that future. So if we frame the future, we need to look historically back and forward. There was a <clears throat> very important article that came out in 2002 that defined the Anthropocene, essentially the period of geologic time dominated by mankind. And it was, the beginning of it was actually defined as the period when bubbles and polar ice could be seen to contain industrial methane and CO2, in other words, the Industrial Revolution. It also is about the time when the planet had essentially 1 billion human beings on it. So it's important that when we look at the future, we have to think about the Earth system and the human system. So the Earth system, the biosphere, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, and the geosphere, all are impacting these days on the human system. So Earth materials are at a very complex intersection of these two very complicated systems themselves. So as we look at the Anthropocene, what do we see? Well, not surprisingly, it's defined by an increase in use of energy. And with that, then we have an increase in CO2, which is driving the climate crisis. Along with that, of course, we have an increase in the amount of earth materials, such as shown here, metals, uh, which have gone up in lockstep with these others. So all this, the, the CO2, certainly leads to the current climate emergency which has been declared in several places around the world, all through Europe, Japan, South Korea, Bangladesh, New Zealand, Canada, French Guiana, and Argentina. And then at least parts of countries have declared it, such as Australia, the Philippines, the United States, Chile, and Brazil, and a number of island nations, obviously. So as we look at the future, we have in green the increase in population, which we expect and hope will plateau out at about 11 billion in 2100. And in purple, the line of annual growth rate of world population, which peaked in 1968 and is currently falling quite dramatically. In red, the box, is the time period from today to 2050 when we have to meet the goals for going to actually stabilize climate in a way that makes sense for society. And I would point out that is one generation. So many of you listening will live to see that. And many of you listening are the ones that have to actually take us on this journey to help, well, to make society sustainable. And this brings us to how we get to a just, equitable and sustainable society. And we have a framework for this. And this framework is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And earth materials are linked to each of these goals. So what I want to go through today is what earth materials are, how they relate to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, where they are on the planet, how they're produced, and how they interact with the circular economy, and then with some visions for the future. So earth materials, we can divide them into metals, industrial minerals, and building materials. And it's critical to point out that water is also a very important earth material, but I'm not considering it in this talk. So in terms of metals, division into bulk metals, those that we use in very large quantities, such metals as aluminum, copper, iron, manganese, nickel, and zinc. And what I've called the technology, or some people call critical metals, those that are actually used in high tech and especially devices and machines that are gonna help us get to our decarbonized future. Some of those metals include cobalt, germanium, gallium, indium, lithium, the rare earth elements, and tellurium. So in terms of the SDGs, metals are a major component in renewable energy and in the electrification of transportation. And so in black circles, I've shown 
where they are really critical to meeting the UN SDGs. But it also must be acknowledged that producing these metals can have real uh, negative impacts uh, in their both extraction and use, and we have to reduce that. And so the places where those are outstanding, I've shown in a red circle. So metals like those on the left, this would be copper and cobalt from the Democratic Republic of Congo, are absolutely critical to build wind turbines that we see on the right. And those wind turbines are required if we're going to get to our decar decarbonized future. Industrial minerals are necessary for agriculture and a wide range of manufacturing. Without them, we really could not grow the food we need to sustain the planet. So in, red, in black are again shown where the, these industrial minerals are critical to meet UN SDG goals. But yet again, they also have negative impacts in production, and those impacts have to be reduced going forward. So the primary places where those impacts occur I've shown in the red circles. So this is a rather spectacular image of potash, which is used uh, for sustainable agriculture. It's one of several industrial minerals. Others are used in construction and manufacturing. And then we turn to the last group of materials. And those are the building materials, also sometimes called construction or development materials. They are necessary for, for the rebuilding of more efficient infrastructure, energy efficient infrastructure. And again, that's positive in the sense of the black circles for reducing poverty, good sanitation, renewable energy, infrastructure, economic growth, et cetera. But they also can have negative impacts of production, which again, must be reduced. And this rather spectacular image, which was highlighted in an earlier lecture, lecture from the Atlantic Magazine, shows two images of Shanghai, 1987, 2013, and 26 years apart, and it demonstrates the absolutely explosive growth in China, which is still ongoing. And we actually need in the developed world to rebuild energy efficient infrastructure all, all across the developed world. And just as important, if not more so, to construct energy efficient infrastructure throughout the developing world. Obviously, it's going to take a huge amount of building materials. And in terms of amount or scale of the sort of things we have to produce, I just wanted to use this example. The images on the left are the Bingham Canyon mine in Utah and the United States. And it's one of the largest uh, excavations that humanity has ever produced. So um, for just one metal copper, which is what this mine produces, the annual world consumption is approximately 24 million tons per year. And that is the equivalent of all the copper that's been produced from this mine since its opening in 1902 to last year. So what that means is humanity is actually using total resources of a Bingham Canyon scale deposit each year, which means we have to find and put in production another one just to keep up or figure out ways to recycle a similar amount of metal that has come out of this, this deposit. Those are, uh, that's tall order. And that brings us then to thinking about the circular economy. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation, I think, has a very elegant way of thinking about it. And they show that the circular economy is based on the principles of designing out waste and pollution, keeping products and materials in use, and importantly, regenerating natural systems. So if we look at, the circular economy in terms of just earth materials. It's a diagram from EIT raw materials. It shows that the input comes from primary resources found by exploration. Then there's mining, processing, production of raw materials themselves. Each of those can, steps can produce waste. Designing production of implements or manufacturing, that can produce waste as well. The use of the, of the raw materials in some devices, and then collection and recycling. There's a critical need to reduce waste and increase recycling at every one of these stages. But there's also a critical need for material stewardship to ensure produced materials stay in use for as long as possible. This is a on the right, a, a diagram from Shiachi and others, 2015. And it's just showing in the periodic table what elements currently are potentially recyclable in the way devices are made and those that are currently unrecyclable. The good news is there's quite a bit of blue potentially recyclable there, even though we're not necessarily recycling it itself. 
And the other bad piece of news is there's too much yellow. So we need to figure out ways to turn that yellow into blue. And if we look at what we're actually doing here in the EU, um, <clears throat> the EU raw material scorecard, we're doing pretty well in some areas. Lead, we're recycling about 75%. I think aluminum may be a bit higher. Silver, 55%. Copper, very important material, only 17%. Neodymium, which is in magnets, which drive almost all our renewable energy devices, only 1%. And lithium, which is critical for batteries, EVs, and a lot of electronic devices. Right now, we're not, we're not recycling any of it. So recycling earth materials is definitely a part of the solution going forward, but we have a very long way to go. And I do a lot of my work in Africa and I, I get to interact there and see things. And what I actually notice is those with less economic ability often recycle a lot more than those of us with more economic ability. And I would suggest that uh, we probably need to learn a lot from them. So where are earth materials? Um, some sources of building materials, sand, gravel, stone, actually are found very widely across the planet and are relatively easy to source. But the very best sources of many earth materials are unequally distributed across the globe. And it's important to note that countries are not created equal when it comes to earth material endowment. And several examples of this in the, in the image. So in the middle, phosphate, you can see that phosphate, which is critical for sustainable agriculture, is really produced in large quantities in three countries, United States, Morocco, and China. Below that, copper. Copper actually comes from a diverse set of places around the globe, and they're shown in areas of pink and black. So while there is quite a few areas where we can get copper, note that there's quite a few areas also that we cannot. Platinum group elements in the upper right are even more um, distributed very, very limited in a limited way. Most of our platinum comes from Southern Africa and the other next largest amount from Northern Russia, some from Eastern Canada, and then minor sources in the United States and China. So what we have is many sources of earth materials are actually located far from locations of consumption and this means there's significant energy required to move them around the planet. And how has this changed through time? Well, it's changed significantly. So if we sort of look at the Anthropocene, we're not quite back at the beginning, but close. What we can see is in the 19th century, mining was concentrated in Europe. By the time we get to the early 20th century, that is switching rapidly and mining becomes concentrated in the United States. As we move into the late 20th century, several different things happen. Uh, we have a major amount of production in what was then the USSR and areas in Chile and Peru, South America actually become major producers as does Australia and Canada. Moving closer to the, to the bar, which is the present, we can see that we actually are mining in many places around the globe. Uh, Europe now has fallen to last. Pink is China, and I wonder about this. I suspect it actually should be higher than is shown here. But overall, we have a diversification of places where we are producing metals. So how do we produce these different earth materials? Different types of earth material deposits require different types and scales of production. Bulk materials mining for bulk metals, industrial minerals, and some build building materials usually carried out at large scale by mining companies or quarrying companies requiring large labor forces. And most of these need to utilize technologically optimized approaches to develop uh, economies of scale. And a typical operation will be shown in the upper right. Uh, that's a, a mine in Ghana. Niche materials, which would include many technology metals, high value industrial and construction minerals or materials can often be mined in modern way with small scale operations that may not be labor intention intensive and potentially these have short term and small footprints. And the image there shown just came up is a in situ copper operation in Southern Arizona where in fact there are no miners. Uh, solution is pumped into the ground, picks up the copper, 
the solution then goes to the building in the background where the copper is stripped and the fluid is then pumped back underground to pick up more copper. Now, many types of materials can also be produced by formal, informal, artisanal mining, which you heard about in this lecture series as well. It's generally labor intensive, and I'm not gonna talk much more about that, but it's important to note that, that it does exist and it's very important in some areas of the world. So earth materials production. I would argue that all earth materials production projects with the possible exception of artisanal sites require that a project have high economic returns and low adverse social and environmental impact. I will state that, that instead of high economic returns, there are some projects that are run because of important governmental functions, that the things produced are critical for national goals, it could be defense or for national employment. So there are exceptions, but I think almost all projects need these two factors. And it's important to note that there are real social justice questions around production of earth materials. This is a map from the Environmental Justice Atlas, which is showing projects where there's conflicts or resistance. And these are just projects for building materials, so sand, gravel, um, quarries, et cetera, mineral ore production and mining, and mineral processing. And you can see there's an awful lot of dots on that map. So there are a number of places where there are clear social issues. And this brings us to government and regulation. Effective domestic regulation in governments of earth materials production operations are critical to enable these operations to have a positive impact on the lives of people living in proximity to the operation. Responsible corporate practices have to go hand in hand with good governance to ensure effective partnerships. And this is difficult in some parts of the world. Transparency and real cooperation are critical at all stages of projects, from exploration through production to closure and beyond closure, to realize mutual benefits for communities, governments, and companies. So this gets us to supply chains. Uh, they also will, I think, increasingly be regulated and have governance issues. A seminal thing happened back in 2010 with the passage of the Dodd-Frank Law in the United States. And section 1502 of that law dealt with conflict minerals. And it required uh, people who used these minerals in manufacturing and production to be able to understand and document where they came from. So NGO efforts and subsequently government actions have helped to establish the idea that companies are individually responsible for the impact of their business anywhere along the supply chain poor earth materials. The leading international standards for this kind of supply chain diligence was developed by the OECD and the UN. And I think in the future, there's probably gonna be a huge additional focus on supply chains from consumers, which really is gonna drive the behavior of how we produce earth materials. Assessments are important. All projects today undergo assessment before they go into production, uh, with the exception of some artisanal uh, operations. So assessments, we've had several, century, several centuries to develop the means of evaluating economic aspects of a project. And over the past, past 50 years, we've refined the means of conducting environmental assessments of such projects. But I would argue we're still struggling how to adequately assess the highly varied and commonly site-specific social impacts of projects. So looking at the grand challenges, clearly the climate emergency. We require earth materials to allow us to decarbonize our way of life and to provide equitable and just standards of life for everyone on the planet. But production of such materials, if not done well, can actually exacerbate the climate problem through increased energy usage and adverse land use. So we have to be smart about how we do it. Biodiversity, is directly linked to geodiversity. The two can't be separated, um, right? So they have to be considered together. And as this article from Nature Communications uh, last year shows, renewable energy production will exacerbate mining threats to biodiversity. I would wish the, uh, the title was could or can exacerbate rather than will. Uh, I don't think it's necessary that it has to. But production of earth materials 
needs to continuously remain cognizant of threats to and opportunities for increasing biodiversity. And an example I'm sort of familiar with having worked on and off here for many, many years is the Karajas district in the Amazon. Now this Google image uh, from last year shows the area in dark green, which is remaining Amazon forest. And it turns out the area in the red circle there is the Karajas mining reserve. As you can see, ironically, the reserve is actually protecting the original Amazon jungle, whereas all around it, it's being deforested. I went to work in this area in the early 80s, actually 1982. This is an image from 1986. The forest here now is red, it's a Landsat image, and the areas that are deforested are sort of the pale blue or, or more white. And what you can see is clearly, there's been a lot of deforestation in this area since the 80s. In 82, there was actually, it was all forest. Um, and what's left is, is the mining reserve. In terms of the amounts of earth materials, we've only scratched the surface of the planet in our search for the earth materials we need. And so if we look at that apple, we've barely dented, uh, in fact, we have not gone through the, the outer skin of that apple looking for these materials. We really should have no fear of running out of any of these earth materials in the future. But the location of such resources may be problematic for societal reasons. And I think we always have to have hubris. Um, one of my favorite sort of stories is this, this building. This is the Pantheon in Rome. It's 2,000 years old, and it's been standing that whole time despite earthquakes, et cetera. And this building has the largest unreinforced concrete dome in the world. Let that sink in. The oldest one in the world is 2,000 years old, but it's the biggest, right? And what's amazing is we actually don't know how the Romans made that concrete. We have some ideas, but we can't actually reproduce the concrete in this ceiling. So we need to step back and think about this. Technology has allowed us, as humanity, to undertake absolutely amazing feats of earth materials production, processing, and manufacturing. And we're adept at evaluating technical, economic, and increasingly environmental aspects of this production. We have to acknowledge that right now we lack the knowledge of how to most efficiently recycle what we produce, and we need to work on that really hard. And we're only now discovering how we properly evaluate and mitigate the societal impacts of such production. And that's gonna be really important in the next generation. We must recognize that we're on a journey. And it's a journey to learn how to sustainably live on our planet and utilize its materials in a way that allow us to solve our multitude of challenges, climate, biodiversity, and societal. And we have one generation to do it. Our young people have taken up the challenge, and I believe they will be equal to the challenge of ensuring we use earth materials for a sustainable and a thriving society. And I think the next talk you'll hear will focus on that to some degree. So with that, I would like to thank you very, very much and hope to take your questions at the end. Thank you. Hi. My name is Hallelujah Kanjo, a PhD candidate. In the first part of this last UNESCO lecture series, we listened to Prof. Mary Hitzman talk about how the reliable, affordable, and just supply of earth materials can provide foundation for a sustainable future. He also added that diverse young people are the key to that future. So for my part, I'd like to share collaborative work I've worked on with diverse young people from all over the world. And this is to really show that we are listening, we are watching, we are learning, and we have taken up the challenge to ensure that the earth resources are utilized in a sustainable manner. Just a bit about myself, I was born and raised in the northern flatlands of Namibia, where the word geology is really foreign. But despite it being foreign, I still enrolled for geology at the University of Namibia in 2010 and went on to complete a master's in economic geology at the University of the Witwatersrand. I've also had opportunities to work in the industry, exploring for base metals in Namibia. So with bending topics around how society should meet the challenge of providing natural resources, be it water, energy or minerals, it was only right to have young career geoscientists and social scientists in one room to learn, to share and sort of debate on how best that can be achieved. 
So this was achieved through a Restore Summer School which was hosted by ICRAG under the patronage of UNESCO. So the Restore Summer School brought 42 young researchers from 21 countries to Ireland for a week-long workshop on natural resources. The participants were presented with four challenges that we needed to work on in detail and sort of come up with best ways on how best they can be achieved. Those challenges included public acceptance of the extraction industry, community engagement in earth resource extraction and use, earth resources and circular economy, and finally, ethical and responsible sourcing of earth resources. Some of the key takeaway notes from the workshop are that it's not enough to just provide the public with information about resources and extraction, but it's also important to consider people's values, emotions, perceptions, and attitudes towards your sciences and resource extraction. It was also noted that it is important to engage in dialogues with communities and different publics. When it comes to community engagement, it is a process and not an event. It should be continuous and should be flexible. And every engagement plan must change based on the situation. For full reports on the workshops and the presentations, please do visit the Restore page on the iCRAG website. So at the end of the summer school, we were sort of asked to type in a word that comes to mind that sort of sums up the experience um, of the week. And you can see a lot of collaboration, complex, challenging, community, engagement, and of course cookies, because we had so many cookies during this week. Moving on to another collaboration, SGA Visual Seminar. So the SGA IGS, in cooperation with the University of Namibia, the Geological Survey of Namibia, and the Namibian Uranium Association, plus the SGA Student Chapters in Ivory Coast and Senegal, organized a visual seminar on green metals for a sustainable society. So this visual seminar is really aimed to serve as an introductory session to the postponed short course, which was supposed to take place in November last year in Namibia. So it was aimed to learn, to share, and discuss different green metal energies with special focus to Africa. These topics were chosen by the organizing committee and they're presented by 16 young researchers from eight African countries. The topics involved uranium, bauxite, and titanium. There was also a special focus on lithium batteries and sustainability of rare earth elements and environmental and societal risks on mine waste. Some of the key takeaway notes is that Africa needs to place more emphasis on local processing and transformation of whatever metal for equitable and fair trade in the mineral sector. We need to advocate for responsible mining to reduce impact on biodiversity, land and water. We need to integrate rehabilitations and closure activities. And finally, we need to promote community engagement. So geoscience communication must be done in Africa and elsewhere in the world. Another project or collaboration I'm happy to share is the IGCB Project 685 under the theme Geology for Sustainable Development under the leadership of Prof. Ian Stewart. So in 2020, the Namibian team consisting of young geoscientists put together promotional materials, a three-minute animation video, under the themes Geology for Sustainable Development aimed to raise awareness on how geology or geosciences contribute to sustainable development in a Namibian case study. Please enjoy. Do you know someone who studied geoscience and ever wonder what they do? Do you know how geoscientists contribute to sustainable development? Well, let's find out. Geoscientists study all matters and processes that form the earth. This includes natural resources, the environment, the atmosphere, and natural hazards. Namibia is globally known for its vast mineral resources, which are unevenly distributed across different geological settings. These resources are discovered by great geoscientists, who then assess their value and contribution to the country's economy. These resources are essential in our daily activities. Diving into the Atlantic Ocean, we find diamonds, which are used in making fine jewelry and industrial tools. The exploration of hydrocarbons in the Namibian waters has the potential to meet energy needs for the future. Majority of minerals used in our daily lives are found inland. 
This includes zinc, which is used in corrugated iron sheets and medicine, copper in electrical wires and water pipes, while gold and silver makes fine jewelry. Furthermore, we use graphite in pencil lead, cobalt and lithium in batteries, fluoride in our toothpaste, while rare earth elements make up components found in our computers and cell phones. Sand and gravel are used as building materials for construction purposes. Geoscientists play a major role in finding groundwater. Since Namibia is a dry country, there is effort in drilling boreholes for groundwater access and building dams to provide clean drinking water. Additionally, Rakana Hydroelectric Power Station, which generates power from the Kunena River flow, supplies about 30% of the country's energy needs. The Namib Desert, the world's oldest desert and a UNESCO World Heritage Site, is home to significant landmarks such as the Sources Plate with the world's highest sand dune, the Velvicha Mirabilis, endemic to the region, and breathtaking sunsets. Through geotourism, geological landscapes provide a greater understanding and appreciation of geological sciences. So, how do geoscientists contribute to sustainable development? Majority of these resources are non-renewable and geoscientists ensure that they are utilized to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs. All these activities take place with environmental protection in mind, maximum community involvement to empower the nation, and community development. That is why Namibia is taking part in the Global Sustainable Development Goals Initiative with geoscientists contributing to the following. For these goals to be achieved, it is important for our community and policymakers to understand the importance of geoscience and its contribution to sustainable development. Get to know Namibia's geoscientific community, a society that works and cares for you. And the last collaboration I'd like to share with the world is the Equality, Diversity and Int Inclusion in Geosciences EDEC project. So EDEC project was started by a group of ICREG scientists working with um, external geoscientists and other experts to gather to better understand the impacts of um, prejudice, inequity, sexism, bias, exclusion and discrimination within the larger geoscience community and to really promote progressive action. So to better understand the challenges, a survey was sent out and we received about 700 participants from all over the world. The results from the survey were used to structure a conference, which was a success. It was well attended between the 15th and the 16th of December last year. The conference was divided into three sections and ended with a workshop on unconscious bias. So the three sections or three sessions um, during the workshop included the history of diversity in geoscience is more like the past and the present on how it can become more inclusive and the future on how we can move forward together. To access the materials from the workshop and from the, the conference, please do visit our YouTube channel, EDEG Conference. You'll be able to access all these materials and you'll be able to take part in the discussion. And I am going to share a video or a clip to just show what EDEG means to the ICREG um, team or the committee. EDEG means not having to be fearful to be who you truly are. Huge amount of talent that is out there. An inspiring community of empowerment. EDI to me means everyone doing it. The numerous benefits that diversity has within the workplace. When I think of EDIG, I think about how we can all work together to make geosciences more accessible. EDIG is all about the positive changes we want to see within our geosciences community. It's time to smash those barriers and be more inclusive in the geosciences. There is more coming for EDIG. Please do look out on our website and also on our YouTube channel for ways you can get involved of ways you can support this initiative. And lastly, I would like to sort of share my vision for the future as a young geoscientist. And most of these things are things that we hear every single day, but yes, I will repeat them. So we need to strengthen collaboration between universities and academia. 
I mean, between academia and industry, we also need to strengthen collaboration between developing countries and developed countries. And we need to provide equal platform for researchers in Africa and other developing countries to sort of showcase their work and also to get the recognition their work deserves. Global network is also one of the things that we need to work on. And it is through networking that a collaboration are born. Data access, we live in the world, we live in the digital world, so we need to make sure that data is available in an interactive manner. We shouldn't be in an era where we're hustling for data. Data should be available, should be clean, and should be easily accessible. We need to reuse, we need to reduce, and we need to recycle. For example, we are moving to um, the green technology. We are using lithium batteries, but there are not a lot of success stories on the recycling of the lithium batteries. So we need to innovate and we need to make sure that we achieve that innovation to reuse some of these things. Additionally, I would like to see a future full of funding opportunities for women. And it's just not funding opportunities, it should be funding opportunities and women should be properly supported. Because funding is one thing, support is another thing. I would also like to have more discussions around community engagement. So we need to educate the publics on the risks and benefits of mineral production. We need to work together to understand the concerns of different publics, example, the government, local communities, NGOs, and everyone that is concerned about or is interested about in the mineral um, industry. We need to engage in outreach exercises dedicated at decision makers and also the general public on the importance of earth resources or earth sciences and how it is key in driving the sustainable development that everyone is talking about. And for me, the last and really the important thing is government policies. It is important for countries to have their rules and regulation in places. Changing government policies can have a drastic effect, both negative and positive, on the mining sector. And we have had situations where that has happened. So for me, it is really to have a future where the government sit or involve uh, young geoscientists and older geoscientists to sort of know the value of the resources, to know the values they have in their countries and sort of make roles that sort of benefit both the investors and also the local people. So we need to equally benefit as investors and as local people. And we can only do that if the governments know the value of the resources. And this can only be achieved if they involve young geoscientists and also elder geoscientists. I believe together we can make the geoscience community greater if we work together. And thank you.